Our next speaker is Killian Kleinschmidt. Killian is an internationally known humanitarian and refugee expert with over 25 years of experience as a United Nations official, an aid worker, and a diplomat. He will speak us, to us today about how he is challenging the humanitarian aid sector through a range of unorthodox practices in partnerships, technologies, and financing. Killian. Thank you. Good morning. Building on what we just heard, you remember when Chancellor Merkel, basically a year ago, said, we can do it. Well, actually, we in Europe we made something which is nothing very special. We received a million and a half people. A million and a half people, that's the number of people we sent to the United States every year, only a few years ago. But something extraordinary happened. Something amazing is taking place. A million and a half people, people on the move, refugees, migrants, many on the move, actually waking us up, shaking us up, shaking the establishment, bringing us to rethink what's going on in the world. Suddenly, the theme of migration, people on the move, is in every corner of the world. It's here, it's in universities, it's in civil society, it's in governments, it's everywhere where you go, people talk, about what's going on out there in the world. What is happening? Something is happening. So a million and a, people, uh, and a half people managed to change us. Europe is discovering that our tolerance levels are not very high, that we are thinking about our past. Many are actually daring again to speak the unspeakable and think and dream about fascism as one of the solutions. Europe is currently close to a collapse because we're closing ourselves, because we have forgotten that Europe is about a peace project and it's not an economic venture. We have forgotten that we built Europe to have actually the longest peace period in our history. And then something else, and that's what matters to me because I come out of this world, I come out of the world of the aid workers, the ones you and everybody in the world sent out to patch up the failures of diplomacy, the failures of tolerance, the failures of our world to find peaceful solutions. And I have been out there, in fact, being the excuse for everybody for something which clearly didn't work. Maybe a few figures here. Anybody aware that humanitarian aid, emergency aid, disaster response aid is a mere and ridiculous 25 billion US dollars a year? That is what we pay for our failures. To fix the plight, as we think of 21 million refugees, 45 million displaced people, and about another 60 million people or so in direct need of survival aid. That's what we produce. That's a shame. We're forgetting, of course, that there are a total of roughly three billion people in the world who are not so well off. Three billion, 800 million are going hungry today, still. Nothing has changed for the last few decades, despite all our aid. The percentages have gone down, but the numbers have stayed the same. So let's become real. Now, when I look at an audience like yours, there's uh, one and a half thousand people maybe here in the room. I, as an aid worker, I have a logistic reflex. I don't look at you as people. I look at you as numbers. I multiply you by 2,100 kilocalories. That is what I have to supply to you when you're becoming a refugee tomorrow. That's humanitarian standard number one. I am, me, the aid worker, who will decide about your fate when you are in trouble, 
will give you roughly three gallons of cl uh, clean water a day. That's what the humanitarian standard is about. And you coming from the real estate sector, four and a half square meters, not very sure what that is in um, American <laughs> measurements, but that is what you're entitled to. And yes, you're allowed to share a toilet with 49 other people. So these are humanitarian standards. That's what we do when we try to excuse ourselves. How does this look like? When I was in 2013, coming out of Mogadishu, of one of my, let's say, tougher, uh, tougher assignments, re-establishing UN presence in Mogadishu for the humanitarian sector, I was asked to go to a place in northern Jordan. In northern Jordan, somewhere 10 kilometers, seven miles from the border to Syria. 100,000 refugees, and they are being accommodated in a camp. That's what you all imagine when you hear the word refugees. Camps, tents, emergency, and so on. How does this look like? In order to give you a little bit of a feeling of what I discovered when I was sent up there and why I started thinking about it, you will get now a few images from a small movie, part of a series which we did there in Jordan. Now, a day in the life of Zatari refugee camp in northern Jordan, home to 100,000 Syrian refugees. <laughs> and they have to walk across the desert, and sometimes they get lost. And sometimes they get lost. We're building a temporary city in the desert in the while desert. people are coming. <laughs> This is a beautiful example of how it should not be. You were the first ones to show me that this is possible to work together on one project. So what we're seeing is, is um, many more refugees coming across, uh, wounded, injured, traumatized. Well, on earth you have seen children of this age stealing a police station. If we don't work together, who is going to do this? Tonight we expect the 900 that we have had up to 3,000, 4,000 people in one night coming in. Anywhere else in the world, it takes 20 years to set up a functioning community. We did it in months. It is now coming to real life. Welcome to my world. That is what I found when I was sent to Zatari camp in Jordan. What I found as well were people rebelling. People rebelling against what we thought was the right way to help people. That's what we had learned. That was the 2,100 kilocalories the four and a half square meters, the three gallons of water, five people per tent. That's it, what we had learned. And yet every day people rebelled, rebelled against that situation in a camp. For once we had achieved what we thought was, would make poor people happy who had just escaped from war. But we had forgotten that actually they have human DNA. They're people. They're human beings. It's not just, just stamped here. I'm a refugee. I'm a migrant. I'm poor. And that's why I'm happy just with survival. Because I'm also aware 
that there's something else in the world. Now I will tell you a few stories, but they did actually in the camp. It drove us crazy. You're in real estate. They stole 85 buildings, 85 communal toilets, kitchens, washrooms in any form, fences, everything was stolen. Even the police station we refer to was taken away. What did they do with this? Well, they were not happy that we put tents and then containers into rows, which didn't allow to shape their own space. They were not happy, and so you wouldn't, to actually go with other people to the toilet, to the kitchen, and to the bathroom every day. So they took the materials and they built their own toilets, their own kitchens. Wonderful. Or was it crime? They took the electricity from the public lighting, as it should not be. But 450 electricians connected two wires, and then they had power too, and it gave social life, security, and it gave also economy. The place changed into a living space. The place changed away from what we had designed as a storage facility into something what is a modern city and what modern people all want, to be individuals, to have their own space, to have access to connectivity with the world. I remember when Secretary Kerry came to visit in 2013, of course, people were still complaining about basics. They were complaining about the fact that we didn't allow them then to be individuals. Once we had understood they wanted to shape their own lives, that they wanted to live as anybody else, that we were working together on the same, in the same directions, on the same vision of creating a city somewhere up there in the desert of northern Jordan, it became peaceful. No demonstrations, no stone throwing, no tear gas. And the complaints to many congressional delegations from the United States, for instance, were about slow connectivity, about slow internet. The fact that they wanted actually to learn and access knowledge through the net. And that became actually our biggest problem. It also became a problem that people were beginning to create. And here, I will now go to some of our innovative partnerships we have built up. Innovative partnerships in the humanitarian sector usually mean I come to the private sector and I ask you, give me money. If I'm very advanced, they will ask you, well, help me to set up my logistic system or help me to donate me some software. But no, we went further. We asked a Korean electricity company to help us to design a system for prepaid meters. San Edison came and offered to build a solar power station, which never happened because we were too stupid, but it was not the private sector. We had corporations with a number of companies, with a number of um, of uh, very innovative uh, technology providers, which actually allowed people to build stuff themselves. When we started, and that's a wonderful example, when we started our cooperation with the city of Amsterdam, because once I had recognized I was in fact not a camp manager, I was a mayor as the manager of the United Nations in this place. I was the mayor, an unelected mayor. I asked the city of Amsterdam to come and help us to deal with the spatial management of a place where 100,000 people live. And here's the wonderful little story. When the transport manager, the chief of the transport services of Amsterdam came, who had asked to develop a public transport system, he walked around, and as a typical Dutch, he asked, why don't you have bicycles? <laughs> People said, well, let's look. 
And he said, you know, with bicycles you can do a lot of things and we will donate you 10,000 bicycles we have actually confiscated and they will come. Typical Dutch. One and a half years later, when the donated container of bicycles came, the first bicycles, guess what? People had set up their own shops selling bicycles. We had pizza delivery service on a mountain bike. We had rickshaws constructed, other devices which people had Googled from the net. So they had learned themselves of how to build actually their own transport devices. And a little story was they actually had also something like donkey carts, stolen donkeys from the villages, built carts. And after a while they said, no, we don't need the donkeys anymore. We just need an engine on the donkey cart and it becomes a car, much more practical. So that's innovation within people, which we need to support, not charity. People were fed up and tired of receiving things they didn't want to eat. So they queued up, had to queue up every two weeks to receive their 2,100 kilo kilocalories, always the same stuff. Some mafia then bought the items, sold them on, and people had some cash to actually buy the things they really wanted. When we recognized this, we asked Safeways and um, a regional supermarket chain from the Middle East to actually set up two supermarkets and people go there shopping with debit cards. And that's about dignity, moving from aid recipients, from charity to happy shoppers in that sense. Now, let us watch, it's a bit longer than this, um, um, a, a movie, a presentation, a film made by the city of Amsterdam about the refugee camp. And it will change your views and your perspective and your appreciation of a refugee camp. Here's the city of Amsterdam with the Dutch Municipality Association. This is Zatari Camp in Al Mafraq province in Jordan. It hosts many Syrian refugees and even more refugees are present in Al Mafraq's towns and cities. Urbanization has accelerated in the crisis and influences the economy, transport, public services, and so on for both Syrians and Jordanians. How does one plan for this area if we do not know what the situation will be like in 2026? How can current work on infrastructure and services also generate longer-term value? A project by the City of Amsterdam and VNG International is adding municipal spatial planning to the humanitarian effort. What does this mean? There are different levels of spatial planning. There is the level of the camp, its grids of roads and sewers, and the location of the hospital, the supermarket, etc. Then, there is the level of the camp and its adjacent towns, their connections and layout, housing here, commerce there, industry there. And there is the level of the province, situated at an international trading crossroads. This is an animated model of the camp made by Amsterdam's spatial planning department. Zatari camp gives structure to the space. The camp's infrastructure will remain for a long time after the tents and cabins are gone. Both the camp and the province stand to gain greatly if investments made now remain useful in the future. How fine or coarse should the grid of roads and services be? What are good places for shops and for the hospital? We will still need shops and a hospital if Zatari camp eventually becomes a residential area. This is what this may look like in 2026. But what if Zatari camp was to become a transport and logistics center? This is what that may look like in 2026. This illustrates what municipal planners call scenario planning. 
Spatial plans need to expand rather than constrain Almafrac's future options. Investment in the grids needs to balance control with flexibility for people and firms. That way, improvements during the humanitarian emergency can create value for Jordan after the crisis. What you have just seen is exactly where we need to move to. Besides the fact that many of the refugee settlements of the past have become the cities of today. Jordan, which we just saw that example of a relatively new camp set up in 2012, 13, has for instance half of its population with a refugee background. Half of the capital city of Amman has been a refugee camp in its past. And so are there many examples throughout the Middle East, throughout Africa, Pakistan, Iran, many places where refugee settlements have in fact indeed become settlements. So is there any reason to keep humanitarians running these places? I don't think so. Professionals have to, be, have to come in and be the ones who develop spaces as they should be together with its citizens new citizens, temporary citizens, but maybe permanent citizens, keeping in mind that the average refugee and war crisis lasts over 20 years today. Very few crises get resolved in a satisfactory manner so that people will return. And what means return to people who have changed during exile, who have urbanized as part of the overall urbanization we just heard in our previous presentation, which is a reality. Jordan is an, is an ex interesting example of how we need to move on because Jordan has now decided that special economic development zones will be the future to actually bring those people who have been considered a liability to work, to become an asset, to become part of a workforce and to become in fact the trigger for, for investment and development. We must move in a direction where demographic changes, in fact, become the shock therapy, the trigger for positive change. And here again, we need to go back to what the Sustainable Development Goals want us to achieve. And guys, 15 years to achieve no more poverty for everyone, that's a, it's a tough call, so we better get going. We better get going to run our world in a different way, to actually look into where the resources are, the knowledge is, and the money is, and how we can in an effective way put it into place where it is needed. One of the observations, and that's what we want to change, is yes, we probably still have a lot of very big issues here in the world to solve, where we haven't really gotten the overall answer, but in fact, for most of the themes and problems we will face in the context of poverty alleviation and actually the access for people, it's the question of how do we share that knowledge effectively? How does it reach people and communities who need it most? I'm sure you're following the offensive in Iraq against ISIS in Mosul. I actually do work in northern Iraq, in the Kurdish region of Iraq, and here I'm, I, I like to, to refer to an incredible situation where communities like the city of Duhuk has already received 750,000 people more. Do they need tents? Do they need emergency support? No, they need sewage systems, they need to deal with a couple of thousands of metric tons of uh, solid waste a day, which was used to be 600 tons of uh, solid waste a day, only four years or five years ago. They need social housing. 
they need actually a, a real boost in their economy. And as somebody said to me recently, a former minister for housing, she said, well, once we get our own economy right and we invest in the, in the future and technologies of the future into energy, renewable energies, into, into housing as well, into uh, building technologies linked to housing, we will not question the presence of any displaced people. We will actually more look into how do we get more workers to come and be part of our community. The traveling of that knowledge, the traveling of that know-how, the traveling of the money is only possible if we all realize that the world is connected and if it doesn't come from us to there, they will come to us in that what we feel is, is chaotic. Migration is not a threat. What is a threat if our world remains as uneven and unjust as it is currently? A threat is if entire communities continue to collapse because we don't invest in them, because we don't share our knowledge. And that is, I think, one of the results of the current crisis in Europe that we all have begun thinking about it. What we are now building is the organization of the future. We must be building the organization of the future, which is not centralized as the United Nations and many of the big aid organizations are, the big corporates, but it is composed of a wide, worldwide network of small, decentralized, capable, accessible, and connected units of knowledge, of technology, of finance, which actually address those issues, not from above, but from within. I think, and now I come back to Chancellor Merkel, we can really do it, but it requires us to completely change our paradigm, our narrative, get away from the thinking that we're talking about victims who need our charity, but think about a world which needs our knowledge. Thank you.